Hey everyone, before we start the show, I just want to get some plugs out of the way. If you enjoy this podcast and you're into wrestling, check out the Nerds and Marks podcast or Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling. If you're not getting your fill on movie and entertainment discussion, then check out the Entertainment Buffet podcast. If you want to dive into the world of video games, I highly recommend the Dark Cast by my friends over at DarkStation.com. Listen to them cover important topics and interview men and women from all over the industry. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hello everyone and welcome to Shelved, where we take a look at the unproduced scripts of Hollywood. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. Uh, Today we're looking at a sci-fi script from the 1980s called The Tourist, and it is not the Johnny Depp, Angelina Jolie movie. No, this is a script that was dubbed the greatest sci-fi movie never made. Uh, This project had a classic story in Hollywood of the writer who doesn't want to compromise on their vision and that kind of getting in the way of the movie being made. I mean, it doesn't help that she was paired with a director that was actively trying to destroy her vision. Um, I I recommend doing some Googling about this one because there is an interesting story, and it's a story that any aspiring writer should read. And, I mean, when you sell a script in Hollywood, you are giving away your baby, and it's really hard to see that movie uh, change and become something that you maybe didn't envision but it's one thing you just have to realize it's a business and I'm sure being a selling a script versus being a writer who's actively working on the movie as it's being made is a much different feeling. But this is one of those stories that you kind of hear all the time and it's, it's really unfortunate. It's always sad to hear that somebody can never get a project off the ground, especially one that was as highly praised in the system as this one was. Um, but I sat down with my friend Maggie, who's returning, and you'll remember her from Star Wars and X-Men and James Bond, some of my favorite episodes we've done. But uh, we're both, you know, big sci-fi fans, so she was naturally a perfect fit for this script. And this was one of the first times that me and the guest came at the script from different angles. Um, she enjoyed it a lot more than I did, not to say that I didn't like it completely, but I was definitely uh, bounced off it a little bit more. And it definitely raised a more interesting discussion. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this one. Uh, So this is The Tourist, written in 1980 by Claire Noto, I think it is. Um, Yeah, so I would would recommend maybe reading this script. Because as much as we try to cover all the plot beats, it's a very interesting story. And it's hard to cover everything. It's... Really complicated stuff, so I would maybe recommend checking it out if you like the episode and you want to know more about the script. I would say you just have to read it. Uh, There's some stuff out there you can Google, but you're just not going to get the full effect. Uh, So this is The Tourist, and I hope you guys enjoy. I think this might be an interesting one. Yeah, I think so. It was an interesting script. I, th- I think we might be, from what you said earlier, I think we might be coming from different sides. Yeah, I think we might be. But uh, <laughs> we'll see where we meet. All right, all right. But first of all, since the last time we talked, you finally saw all the James Bond movies. I have seen them all now. I have a couple questions for you. All right. What was your favorite one? I mean, I'm always going to be partial to the Daniel Craig ones. Just, I think those, I, yeah, those yeah. are my favorites. Um... I really liked, um, I'm going to blank on people's name, Tim, Tim, Tim Dalton. Th- I loved those two movies, Me too. actually. Um, prob- it's, it's the ones people talk about the least, but end up being some of my favorites. Yeah, I love it. I really liked I really liked him as Bond. But, yeah, uh, me too. Yeah, I, I enjoyed them. Like I like the campy ones. I like the darker ones. Yeah. What, what would, do you know what your least favorite one would have been? Um... Jeez, uh, which one was it? I mean, I, I feel you, like the classic two are Thunderball and Moonraker. Thunderball, yeah, yeah, it was Thunderball because it just it was so slow and there was so much swimming <laughs> in water and yeah, yeah, that one was pretty brutal. Yeah, um, 
A View to a Kill was low for me, and you ended up liking that one. Yeah, just because it was fun. Jake and I just sat around drinking yeah. and making fun of it, so it ended up being... It, it has some interesting moments, but th- at that point, I was just so tired of Roger Moore. <laughs> yeah, it was... Because he did, he's done slot. the most. He did seven, I think. Yeah, there were a lot of these. Like, yeah, because really? Con- I thought we had a view to a kill one point. Jake's like, no, we got two more. I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> I thought we were almost done with him. Yeah, no, it, he goes on for way too long. He was yeah. he was older than Connery when he started, I think. Yeah, when it he, was like crazy. It, I didn't realize how much older he was, but then at, yeah. at the last two movies, you really see it. Yeah, so then oh, you realize, yeah. oh yeah, no, he is he's old. like barely moving, and he just looks so much older in the face. Like Octopussy was one that I don't. How do you feel about Octopussy? Actually, uh, I like that one. Yeah, because yeah. that was one I always hear a lot of people don't like, and it's like, oh, he dresses as a clown and stuff like that. Yeah, it's but goofy parts. I but... really liked Octopussy. Yeah, like mostly because one of the villain guy that was in the movie, he like he talks a really a proper, <laughs> and I can't, I don't remember the actor's <laughs> name, but he was. I loved watching him on screen and oh, just the way he talked and it was he was so fun. Uh, yeah, my least I think my least favorite villain and I know you like that one was the uh, newspaper the yes. the newspaper Carver, magnet. Elliot Carver. Yeah. Oh, he's <laughs> so good. I he like, I could not he, take it seriously at in all. In all fairness, he's one of my favorites because he's so bad. Like Tomorrow Never Dies is kind of a mixed bag of a movie. I think, I for me, it personally falls on I like it, but that <laughs> kind of goes to my Pierce Brosnan bias where that was the era I grew up watching Bond, so yeah. Pierce Brosnan was my Bond. And it was the one I saw a lot because it was the only one my video store had that I rented a lot. And I don't know, like going back and watching it is like he's never trying to hide that he's a maniac and he's trying to take over the world. He's he just, announces it. Yeah, it's constantly throughout the movie. And I just think for one, that actor is really good. I mm-hmm. mean, he's in Game of Thrones. He's in a lot of stuff, yeah. um, which I don't know if you noticed he was in Game of Thrones. He's like the high sparrow or whatever. Jake has the amazing talent. As soon as he sees someone on television, he can just pick out what else he they knows were in. exactly. Yeah, he did it with like a char- someone on TV and he like knew they were like a minor character in a video game voice. It's really <laughs> impressive. It drives me insane. I, I, I wish I had that talent because I'm always like, oh, what else do I see him in? And I spend like 20 minutes on Wikipedia. Um, yeah, I liked him. I don't know. He's fun. It's it, Never Dies. It's not a great movie, but I just no. kind of enjoy it. I kind of maintain that all the Brosnans, except for Die Another Day, are underrated. Because mm-hmm. everybody shits on The World's Not Enough. And I would probably put that one in my top ten. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> so. I don't know. I like the villain. The villains. Because I like the guy, uh, Renard, mm-hmm. who can't feel anything. And I like the girl, Sophie Marceau. Yeah, uh, she's really good, good and she's like kind of like overqualified as an actress to be in <laughs> that movie. Fun. Yeah, but she's she's really good, and it's Denise Richards that holds that movie back. <laughs> but I would argue she's not in the movie that much, and she no. doesn't speak very much. I thought she was gonna be a lot worse for how much shit I heard yeah. like she was given, but then she just kind of no, did a couple bad lines, and then was just yeah. behind him a lot. Yeah, it's just exactly that's exactly how I would describe it. She's literally behind him all the time. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I was just curious of where you guys felt, or I wanted to kind of pick up on that since we talked about James Bond the last time you were here. Uh, but this time, we're here to talk about quite a script. <laughs> um, I, I guess it was, it, I, I don't want to say slim pickings because I'm sitting on like so many scripts, but I was like, you know, pushing you to pick something, and this is the one you came to me with, and it was, it was one I recently found, and it... I hate speaking in hyperbole, but it comes with that title of like, this was the greatest sci-fi script never produced or whatever. And in your list, that was the only description really given. So that that was all I I went. That was all I had at the time. Like I didn't seek super deep for like a like log line for the movie. Yeah. But I was like, all right, if they're going to call it that, I guess that should be enough to entice somebody to want to do it. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, like how did, how did you feel about this one? I, I enjoyed it. I actually read it way faster than I've read any other scripts. Yeah. I was flying through it. Cause it I, I will felt, say it was kind of a quick read. Yeah, it was a quick read. And I was just interested to see what was happening. You know, they said, yeah. I think they really created a, she really created a world. Yeah, the, definitely. I mean, I feel like there was definitely a lot of world building going on. Yeah. Um, I like sci-fi world building stuff. Yeah, so. absolutely. No, sci-fi is 100% like probably my favorite genre of movies. So, I mean, my all-time favorite movie is Star Wars. If you want to call that a sci-fi movie to me, yeah. it's more fan. You know, that's a whole argument. Um, yeah, to me, I felt like as I was reading this, I was like, oh, this is what reading an art movie is like. <laughs> <laughs> because there, I felt like there was a lot of stuff going over my head. 
Um, did you happen to look into any of the story of like what happened with this script or anything? Uh, really briefly, I didn't really see much. I saw some of the concept art, which I thought yes, was H.R. Geiger or Giger, however Giger, you say. It. Yeah, I don't know. He did the concept art. He was brought in at one point to do the concept art. So that's yeah. all his stuff. I was wondering if you had seen that. Yeah, it was interesting. That stuff. Yeah, his concept art didn't really match anything that I pictured. No, I couldn't tell what part. It was a concept, yeah, what it was concept yeah. art for, but... I definitely saw some concept art for the, um, I, I guess, the the club, that mm-hmm. they, the, the club of aliens that they go to, um, which is a weird sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay, so it, I guess we just have to start at the beginning with this one. Yeah. So... I just felt stupid reading this thing, because I'm like, th- this thing, they say, you know, the greatest, it's, it comes with that title. Um, so I guess the story is she, the, the writer, Claire, I assume it's Claire because there's no E at the end. It's C-L-A-I-R. Yes, that's right. Uh, Claire well. Noto. She, so she, I guess she was working at, I believe it was Paramount or Universal, one of those studios. And she was writing this script. And she was, this is in 1980 when this was written. So she was working with this guy. And she, as she was writing it, she was sending it, like I guess, like 10 pages at a time to this guy. He was giving her notes and sending it back. And that's how they wrote the first draft. Um, this guy leaves. He either gets promoted or he, you know, quits the job. Mm-hmm. And then she gets, she gets, somebody else takes his position. She starts working with this person. And then it's kind of, you know, they're working together. And then this guy gets promoted. And then another guy comes in who, from all intents and purposes, sounds like a complete asshole. <laughs> uh, he's basically, so the middle guy, he was like, we need to do some rewrites or whatever. And I guess the problem is, and this is pretty common in Hollywood, especially from writers. She didn't want to change anything. Yeah. And that is basically going to sink a script. Yeah. Um, I know I, uh, my parents went to school with a guy who's now a film director in Texas mm-hmm. and I bounce back and forth ideas off him all the time. We're in contact and he was working on a project that I was actually going to fly to Texas and like hang out with him on. And like, he was like, Oh, I'll throw you in the background and stuff. And, but this movie ended up falling through because they were working with a writer who refused to change anything. It's just, it's putting a nail in the coffin of your project, basically. Um, so I, I guess what was happening is this middle guy, they were working on rewrites or whatever, and she just wasn't having it. And then that guy got promoted. Then they bring in this other guy who, or I think it was a woman, who liked it and wanted to move forward with it. And then they, I guess they hired a, I think he was going to be the director. I should have wrote down these names. I was reading this like 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, and basically he just like was trying to cut her out and he was, we have to change everything. Like he was basically wanted to change stuff to spite her. And it just sounded like the story was, and everybody involved in the project pretty much agrees that this guy was just an asshole and he was just trying to be a dick to her and just didn't like her and was basically wanted to remove, like change everything so much that she just wanted nothing to do with it. And this, that's eventually what just drove this thing into it's the ground. It's got to be so hard between protecting your baby of a script and actually wanting to get it made, you know? Because yeah. you can't be totally inflexible, but if you're too flexible, then no. what are you creating? And yeah, and apparently, so the draft we read is her first draft. And I guess there are other drafts that happened afterwards, but this is the only one that's seen the light of day. But this is the one she wrote, and this is the one she stood by, and like, this is how it needs to be done. This is how I picture it. I don't want to change anything. Mm-hmm. Um and obviously that didn't work out for her. No. And I can see why a studio apparently people loved this draft. Um it was really high regarded within the studio. They just didn't want to make it. And I can easily see from reading it why it's 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 a risky movie. Like it's Yeah. I will say while I kind of bounced off of it whereas you seem to like it a lot more. Um, it was interesting. I've never read anything like this. It's definitely pretty original and drawing, seeing, uh, there were things that she listed as her inspiration. One was, uh, the day the earth stood still the old fifties movie, which I don't know if you've seen, but it's, that's where the, you know, the Klaatu Vrata Nick Toe classic line comes from. And it was the idea of like, Oh, he takes off his spacesuit and he just looks like a man and he's just living in among us. And that was kind of one of her big inspirations for the movie. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, so I guess you just want to start from the beginning of the script here. Yeah, script, yeah. sure. Uh, um, it's about a woman. Yeah. And you don't notice anything weird about her to begin with who no. lives in a city and she... In New York in particular. Yeah. Which is one of the things the guy wanted to change. He wanted to move it to San Francisco just because. 
wouldn't fit the tone of the movie in my no, mind. No, I think New York, New York is, is kind of New York is notorious for being that like, oh, you could just do anything weird on the streets of New York and nobody's gonna care. Yeah, and but but in a, and I know that San Francisco a little bit of that, but New York in a darker way, you yeah. know. And I think that fits the tone of the movie. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Nicolas Cage movie, The Vampire's Kiss? I recently watched it. Actually, oh my god, <laughs> yeah. you watched it? Yeah. I've never even watched it. It's great. So the scene where he's running down the streets of New York, he's just like, I'm a vampire. I'm a vampire. Everybody on that street is not an extra. They just filmed that. They didn't tell anybody. They are and wonderful. Nobody cares. Everybody's just walking down the street ignoring him. And that's just kind of the city New York is. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you can see video cameras. But from what I understand, it was shot pretty gorilla. And they just sent Nicolas Cage on the street to act like a madman. And nobody stopped or did anything to interfere. The movie was on, at least was on Amazon Prime not too long ago. So oh, I man. would suggest it if it's still available. Uh, oh, I might have to convince them to try to watch it in the back there. Um, okay, so we're introduced to our kind of, th- there's three main women of the story, and we're kind of introduced them right away, which names in the story get a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got Grace as our main character, mm-hmm. and then we have Marty, who's our assistant, who at first I thought was a guy, and then very quickly I kept reading she, and then her friend named Spider O'Toole. Best name. Yeah, which she, at the end of the script, she does give a different name. I, I, didn't yeah, catch it. at some like, point she just gives it's like Agnes or something like very plain. Where you'd want to, of course, be called Spider O'Toole. Yeah, Duh. <laughs> like, like it's, it I sounds like it. something you got tattooed on you and you had to come up with a reason. Yeah, Spider. Um, yeah, Spider O'Toole, who also has one good eye and one like gray yeah. blind eye. She's got a lot of stuff going on besides the name Spider O'Toole. You think <laughs> yeah. that would be enough? But she's got one like gray eye and dresses very flamboyant. Oh, and she is the weirdest character in the script by far. Yeah. Um, and then we get introduced to a, a male character who is maybe the biggest piece of shit I've read in a movie <laughs> named Jack Crosby. Yeah. Or is it John is. Crosby? It's his Crosby, Crosby is all yeah, they call him. Um, I, I Ooh. screenshotted some of this guy's dialogue. Oh God. Um, so right away he's basically just hitting on her and like just straight up saying like, Hey, why won't you fuck me? And he's yeah. just like being a dick. And so I, they, um, we, int- we get introduced to these characters in the beginning and then they go to a party and they're kind of across the room from each other at a party, Grace and Crosby. And this is a line directly as it's read from the script. It says, Crosby is sitting across the room with a group of gay men. And it says, Crosby, to the gays, you guys have the right idea. The hell with women. I'm with a woman now, and she won't even screw me. Yeah, I mean, he he starts there and then gets worse. Yeah. Like, that, that's his baseline. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but this is how he is before a possible rape commences. Yeah. Uh, this guy and a lot of the men in the script are not very good characters i found it it's so interesting to read a script written by a woman especially after the last couple of scripts we read yeah. have been star wars <laughs> x-men and james bond yeah where every single additional character even if they're there for a line or two are men and this one yes. they aren't all and that's like even the first three pretty much characters that are introduced are all women i was just like yeah whoa Nice. <laughs> this was a nice change of pace okay. for us. Well, there we go. Yeah. And then most of the men are introduced are kind of pieces of shit. I mean, there's like one good guy, and that's Vic, the who she meets at this party. Yeah. He's kind of, he's a, handsome he works. Man. Yeah. He's like the handsome man that she likes. He's a work, he's like a stagehand at a play, mm-hmm. I believe. And yeah, so they kind of meet at this party and they're flirting or whatever. But uh, kind of my first problem with this script is events just kind of seem to happen. And then we just transition to the next thing. And some of that transition f- seems a little sudden to me. I don't know if you felt the same. Yeah, there's some things where I took me, like, I had to go back and I'd be like, okay, so what just happened? And nothing. It just kind of moved. Yeah. And a lot of the dialogue seems to just be in service of moving to the next scene. Like, there, there's a scene uh, the last, like, 20 pages where we, we are introduced to this other character. We'll get there. But um, they're literally just talking, and she's like, well, I think it's, it might be dangerous to go with you. And he's like, well, it would be dangerous not to go with me. And he, she's just like, oh, you're right. That then, one was pretty egregious. It, yeah. it stuck out like a sore thumb. Like, uh, Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that was one of the things that definitely felt first draft. Yeah. Um, and I would say, yeah, I guess I would say that about a lot of the dialogue is it, it seems very first draft. 
And I mean, and for all intents and purposes, it is. But it's amazing that that would be the dialogue sitting in the script. And she's like, no, I don't want to change anything. Like, this is perfect. Yeah, I wonder. I, I just wonder what happened now, you know? Yeah, and, and this is something we talked about in our Star Wars episode, is a lot of it feels robotic to me. Mm-hmm. Like, there, like, for the most part, there is some decent dialogue. There is, like, it feels like characters are actually talking to each other. And then there's another part where it feels like I'm reading this and the voice in my head is just that MS-DOS computer voice that you type into your computer. And that's what I'm hearing reading this dialogue. It is very similar to Star Wars. The fact that the, the world is more vibrant than a lot, I mean, a lot yes. of the characters. Yeah. Um, I was, because that, that kind of left me a little confused because I'm like, is this really about Grace or is this just about the world she's inhabiting? Because the whole point of the script, I mean, if we really boil it down, um, she's an alien and she wants to leave our planet. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's like a whole underground society of aliens on our planet. And we, we get a lot about that. And it's just like how they all hate Earth, basically. And they all want to leave, but they're all stuck here. Yeah. Earth is kind of, in this world, an exile planet. Yeah, just like a dumping ground for the worst. At some point, it's revealed Grace wasn't even supposed to get there. That's why she doesn't seem to know about yeah. it. She was kind of put on in a ship, and the ship was yeah. supposed to explode, and it just got to Earth. And we, and we never really get an explanation for why. Or how. Yeah, no, that's just it's just part of the That's world. just her story. Yeah. Um. So while they're at the party, we get introduced to the character whose name seemed to change in the early pages. Uh, They kept, or maybe it was just because this, we were both talking about this, the photocopy of this script was really bad. Like some of the letters were kind of splotchy. A little bit. It was a little hard to figure out. Yeah. But he seems to be introduced as Frogman and then later gets introduced as Frogner. And I I didn't Um, know if. I think that there was something. I, I think that might have been intentional at some point. The, for the at the end of the script, he's called Frogner for the rest of it at yeah. a certain point. But I think that might have been intentional. It, it, at first, it they seemed talk about him being a frog man because he kind of had a, like they talk about like bulgy eyes. I feel like at some point. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't sure either what was going on. Yeah, it, but it, it, it settles into Frogner. And yeah, it was just confusing because in the first few pages, so as she's on her way to this party, he's like following her. Like we we find out in the beginning that Marty, her assistant, is like, "Oh, you have messages from this Frogman guy," and that he follows her to this party. And then this is another one of these scenes where I'm talking about it's like a weird transition. The, the, yeah, this one was weird. He because it's not explicitly clear why this is. It seems like he's following her because maybe of her extraterrestrial origin. Yeah. You, you, that's what you're led to believe. At this point, we haven't even really been hinted at. No, but or no, I mean, like, because something's going on. And then it turns out that he wants to sell her like Christmas, Christmas decorations. decorations. And then and he, she recognizes him as the alien and he's yeah. out of there. And so you wonder why was he... He was so her persistent about it. So secretively and so strangely, if he... If he was the one kind of with the thing to hide, yeah. he didn't know that he had to hide something from her. But it was yeah, that made it, it very weird. It seems to me, it seems to be that she has some sort of ability that she can look in somebody's eyes and tell if they're an alien. Yeah, which it's never. I mean, she does it multiple times. It's always implied. It's never just like, oh, this is something I can do. Which she seems to have a lot of abilities that are just implied. Mm-hmm. Because so he runs away and she chases him. Which, again, a lot of weird transitions at the beginning of this script. Because he ducks into a bar, which just happens to be the bar where Spider O'Toole works at. And Marty's in there, too. And he, like, is hiding from Grace. And then he's, like, you know, trying to play it cool. Then all of a sudden, he just hits, starts hitting on Spider. And it just, like, he's so calm and casual about it as if he wasn't just getting chased. And it's just, like, right in the beginning, there's just, like, a lot of weird transitions like this. Yeah, I think the hitting on Spider thing is kind of hinted at why later yeah because uh, he needs what well, i mean he says he needs to mate we don't know why but seems like he's gonna die well that's the thing it seems all aliens in the script are dying the longer they're on earth yes and there seems to, but there seems to be different reasons for that why yeah. they're dying um some of them can't be near people yes like she for instance can't have human contact uh, yes or it seems like maybe contact at all. It's, I think it might be contact at all. But uh, the guy at the... Um, why am I blanking on his name? The guy that they're all looking for. John... Tiger. Yeah, John Tiger or whatever. <laughs> uh, he can't... He says that he feels better when he's just completely away from people. Yeah. Frogner he needs to have they sex. Say, yeah, they were saying he was feeling weaker. Mm-hmm. And that like he was just losing energy. So then he went and secluded himself and he was regaining his strength. 
and yeah, this Frogner guy, he so that he seems to be some sort of shapeshifter because he's able to shift between he says the sexes. That he's a I'm a duel, he tells yeah. uh, someone near the beginning of the script. Which I guess that may just be the species of alien he is. Because there are multiple species, but we're never really like, clarified they all on look any pretty of them. humanoid. But yeah, Frogner switches between male and woman throughout the script. Yeah. As he pretty much needs sex. Yeah. Uh, which there's a lot of sexual tones in this script. Yeah. Which I was not expecting as we were reading this. I'm like... <laughs> Like, there's basically tentacle rape at one scene. Yeah. No. And it's just all about sex. Like, that's all anyone is talking about in the script. Because, like, yeah, he's just, like, he, like when he's not getting what he needs, he seems to, like, lose control of his ability. And he starts swapping between sexes uncontrollably. And multiple times they refer to him as being stuck kind of halfway between each. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Um so yeah, she so he runs into this bar and starts hitting on Spider. She uh, Grace runs by and she he ducks out the back through this kind of like loopy scene of him running into the owner who's yelling at some Chinese person like chef or something. And then Grace immediately catches him again and this is kind of the first hint of her something being weird about her cuz she mm-hmm somehow uses i guess some mind control powers or something to like use these like papers to like catch frogner they like go flying and catch him or something right yeah something to that effect there's there's papers and they attack him yeah and then she's like look i know you are what you are and he's just like i don't know what you're talking lady and he just eventually manages to escape and she's just like i'm gonna find you even though she has no way of finding him and just somehow stumbles upon him later because i think spider helps him I think also he 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 wants to be found because his higher up kind of gives him the tells him I need her yeah. because she might help me find John Tiger yeah. guy who's basically our antagonist of the script which is Sloan mm-hmm. I believe um, which I think his name was John too it's like a lot of or no Harry Sloan I'm sorry right. um, yeah so. Uh, Vic, this Vic, so she meets the Vic guy at the party. She chases Frogner out. Then she just kind of goes back to work, and Vic shows up at her work, and we're kind of hinted that there's going to be a romance going on between these two characters. Mm-hmm. And then Spider, who she's kind of just pops up throughout the script at a lot of random places. She's she's kind of the most proactive person in the script. Yeah, she gives people information. Like whenever like someone shows up, I'm like, hey, I'm looking for so and so. She's always like, she always yeah. just seems to know something. Yeah, she's able to provide information. Yeah, or she's always stumbling upon information or stealing information that she's able to use later on. Yeah, uh, she's kind of the mobile character between a lot of locations in this yeah. script. Yeah, because so she stops at the work to pick up Marty and she talks to Grace about Frogner and then that's what leads her to this club of these aliens or whatever Mm -hmm. because Frogner he was hitting on her he's like oh you can meet me here you know and then she tells Grace that so this is where we get introduced to the alien club and Harry Sloan the reason that I think that that was part of the setup is because humans can't get into that alien club yeah so Spider couldn't have gone yeah so she uh oh so you think uh frogner was trying to see if spider could have got in or do you think maybe that's why he was interested in her because of her eye like he thought maybe she was an alien i thought that afterwards because she said that he kept calling i don't think he gave her that information that night so i think after he was told get this girl on our side that's when he Hmm. provided spider the information really so it could be yeah. wrong because how does he know Spider knows Grace? No, they saw he I mean, saw them interact. Yeah. All right, I think that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, th- I that's know. kind of the struggle with this script. Nothing is really clear. It's a lot of you just gotta kind of figure it out. And then when they do start describing stuff, they only describe like a little bit. Like when they describe how Grace got there, it's just like here's a little bit of information of what's going on. Um. So yeah, this is where we, this is where we get tentacle rape and Harry Sloan. Mm -hmm. which was a weird fucking scene. So, yeah, because you're saying they can only get into the club if they're an alien, because she uses some of her powers to kind of unlock the door, and that's how she gets in. And she's just kind of wandering this club, looking at all this array of aliens. And, yeah, she literally is, like, talking to this, like, weird, sluggy, tentacled alien or whatever, and he just doesn't even respond to her, and they say describe a tentacle just, like, going up her dress and then I guess it's Sloan comes and like chops off the tentacle or something. Yeah. Or it's no, somebody it's, in it's there. it's someone else, I believe, in the club. I think it's the girl that's like the door woman, basically. Yeah. Comes and pretty much says, nope, no, none of these guys loud here. 
Yeah. And Grace is kind of horrified by it. Yeah. And then she's the one that brings us to Harry Sloan, mm-hmm. who I guess is running like a self-help or like he's like a psychiatrist or something. Yeah, grief seminar. Yeah, I it was. Yeah, we have like multiple occasions of him doing like group therapy where people just walk in on him saying and doing weird things that nobody seems to comment on. Yeah, there. It's some of the grief therapy stuff. It's pretty brutal. Like yeah. it isn't. It isn't good grief therapy. No. It's like it's quack type stuff. Or yeah, even, and he's the kind of grief therapy a villain would run. Yeah, basically, and it's like people. Like I think the woman at the end of the scribe talking about how she lost her kid or whatever. And yeah, and he's like, so wouldn't she want just for you to forget about her and move on? And yeah, he's like, yeah, I guess I should just forget about my dead daughter. It's yeah, like, mm. and the the way that it was playing through at the end, I was wondering if he had some kind of power that he just uses yes. to make these people get over their problems. Wouldn't surprise me. Like it, it wasn't even really hinted at in the script. It was really just the structure of the dialogue and the way he was saying it and the way they would she would repeat it or whatever. I thought maybe he was influencing her in some way to get over her grief. Hmm. And maybe yeah. that's just how he's running his day to day while he's stuck that. on Earth. <laughs> um, so this is kind of like the first hint at what our plot is going to be. So he wants her to find this Taiga guy. And basically, the she throughout the whole script, she's like, I, I just want to get off Earth. Like, I'm here. I'm not supposed to be here. I don't want to be here. But and she's I being just a high-powered go. businesswoman. Yeah. Which I found interesting. She's a high-powered businesswoman who goes to strip clubs on her lunch. Yeah. Uh, they they constantly interesting life. they constantly talk about her being just like sexually charged yeah and I guess there's some sort of from what I was reading like elsewhere it's like basically she has a frustration because she can't touch anybody mm-hmm. because then they they don't say what's they say that she'll die if it like continues but basically what happens is like at one point she's laying on a couch with this Vic guy later on and she doesn't realize their skin is touching and they start to like cocoon basically. Yeah, and then she's like, rush to the shower, rub yeah. it all off. So it, it's not a good situation. Like they talk about it leaves this like dust and like hard stuff on their skin. Mm-hmm. And they, yeah, you have to get it off or basically it's going to kill you. And we, I don't understand that because like I'm assuming the cocooning would be some sort of reproductive thing. So why would it kill you? Well, when bugs cocoon, when like caterpillars cocoon, their pretty much whole thing turns to like slime. Like yeah. they're just a, like in a but then they become a butterfly. But what happens if two people do that? Yeah, I guess. But it seems like that's supposed to happen in her case. But I mean, she doesn't want I mean, maybe because yeah. it's a human is my thinking. Yeah, I'm not sure. But she really yeah. doesn't want to happen. No. And so, like we said earlier, it's all implied that all these aliens who are on Earth, the longer you're there, eventually you're going to die. Yeah. And Frogner is basically at that point. Like he's... At the point where he's just holding it off as long as he can, trying to find some way to either get off or get help or something. Or get off. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's always it's always hinted that Sloane is just fine. Like somehow he's found a way that he's going to survive. And people and, seem to trust him because of that. Like, yeah. hey, I should stick. Because that's kind of what Frogner's doing. He's sticking around him because he thinks, this guy's got a big secret, and if I'm loyal, yeah. I'm going to get this secret. And I, I believe Sloan says at one point that he's helped him before. So this he seems to have something that every other alien can latch on to. Mm-hmm. Um, but he wants, like, he's been using Frogner to try to find this Taiga guy who's turned up nothing. And then he brings in Grace to do it, and she manages to find him pretty, pretty easily. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Frogner wasn't, eh, he's not that good at his job. Yeah, like, Frogner gives her one little hint of an area that he looked once, and that leads her to multiple, um, like, people that have come in contact with this guy. And are, like, kind of willing and waiting with clues. Yeah, <laughs> it's like they were waiting just for her. Like, so the first thing she seems to do is just pick a guy out of a phone book. And because he implies that, oh, you're I not the he first got person. That phone number from she got that from Sloan, I think. Oh, is that where she got that from? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because she, yeah, she goes to meet this guy, and he's like, oh yeah, this guy has the same name as me. It's not me, but it's like, oh, he just picked my name out of a phone book, which to me led me to believe that's probably exactly what he did. Mm-hmm. And it just happened to be this guy. Um, and then he's the one who he's, he's like, yeah, I get people looking for this guy all the time, and I don't tell these people this, but I something about you, I'm gonna tell you. Yeah. Um, and then is the, he's the one that sends her to the the mother old woman, daughter. the mother daughter. Yeah, which is 
one of the weirdest scenes <laughs> of, in the whole movie, dialogue wise. Because yeah, she gets introduced there. to this woman. She's like, is it the little girl that answers the door? And then there's the woman. And she's just, she's like, I'm looking for this guy. And she just starts talking about her favorite sex position. Yep. Like, completely non-sequitur. unprompted. Yeah. And then she's just like, oh, well, I just like to embarrass people that offend me or something like that. Just like, I guess she offended him just for asking about this guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, cra- it, 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 that one didn't bother me. Cause I'm like, okay, it's a crazy person. Yeah. And her kind of like, crazy daughter. And it seems like she might be obsessed with him a little bit. Yeah. And then jealous. Yeah. Of anyone um, looking for him. Cause I feel like, the, cause it seems definitely like, that looking, like yeah. hoping he'll come back. Yeah. Cause she talks about like, Oh, he lived with them for a while and he gave her some experiences that she'll never forget. <laughs> And then, like, this woman just seems to just trail off into this house. And then the little girl asked her, I don't know if you caught this. I th- and I'm not about even... About sh- the code. Yes, about the code. So there's some sort of alien code Did that... Did you figure they- out what the code was? Because it does come up later. Well, it's pretty much like, don't... It's like their moral law. Yeah, it's like they're more. It's pretty much like don't hurt anyone. Yeah, or if you kill somebody, like, you're going to get killed. Yeah. Because so that, that comes up later with Sloan. So you kind of... So she just mentions this girl who's living with this older woman, like, have you heard of the code? And the woman's like, yes. And she and Grace had previously mentioned it to Frogner because it seems to be something throughout the all of these species that is communal. Yeah. And kind of makes you wonder, is this why they're there? They did something against the code. I mean, I guess that would be a good point. Because it seems to be a kind of through line that everyone knows of this code. Yeah, because that's something I didn't put together, honestly, because they do state that oh like all these people were dumped here and Mm -hmm. everyone hates it like everyone they talk down to humans and they're like they keep calling it this disgusting ball of dirt and everything which like what are other planets made out of um but yeah so she asked the little girl asked her if she knows of the code and then that's what since she knows it that was something that taiga told the little girl to ask if she ever felt comfortable with anybody and that would kind of give her the next clue. So she gives her some information. And then she kind of just decides to go meet Vic after this. Because, like, yeah. yeah, again, I'll just I'll, no transition into s- scenes <laughs> or ideas. She's just like, oh, I'm, this is my next chore for the day, basically. And this is where we get introduced to another one of her abilities, which is whispering orgasms into people's ear. Yeah, that seems to be it. Uh... I mean, she can whisper all manner of things into people's ear. Yeah, that seems to be almost, but it doesn't seem to provide the same kind of release for her. No, because she's still frustrated. Yeah, yeah. I so mean, it's her non-touching way. Yeah, of it's, it seems like she's doing sex. something for somebody else, but basically teasing herself. Yeah, it's her non-touching way, non-deathly way of having yeah. sex, but still not receiving. Yeah, but she's yeah. So there's nothing. That's why we have a couple scenes where she goes to like a strip club. Yeah, like, you just, and, I wonder if she, and there's someone of her own species, what would be? Yeah, which, I mean, that kind of comes up a little later. Um, oh, shit, I just had a thought, and now I totally lost it. I think Because I think this might be the scene. Yeah, this is where they start to cocoon. Because, um, yeah, so he comes by, and she does the whispering thing, which is the only way I can describe it. Because, like, it happens so many times through the script, and her whispering seems to do different things. Because she can whisper to turn somebody on. She can whisper to hurt somebody, mm-hmm. and it seems like she can also do this to heal somebody. But because she heals Frogner at one point, oh, well, I think. But it, it, I think the healing of Frogner was giving him the orgasm. Is that what it was? Yeah, because he needs to have. He's in heat. He says at one point when he's in his woman form, and he will be in his woman form until he has sex. Yeah, and that that's a weird scene where he's like in a warehouse as a woman trying to hook up with some guy there. Who, Full of Santa merchandise. Yeah, it's like they're basically described as like a North Pole warehouse. And uh, this guy, was he dressed as like an elf or something? I don't know. I thought it the most unguy like behavior, though, that he, as Santa, like gets knocked onto him or something, or some sort of a candy cane, some <laughs> Christmas thing. It's yeah. not on. I was like, all right, I'm out of here. She's like, yeah. I'm like, what guy are you? It, it makes, like, this guy gets scared off by something falling into him. And it. I didn't get this scene at all. Like, what is yeah. going on? Yeah, uh, Frogner desperately needs to have sex, and anyone will do. But apparently, this guy is uh, scared by changing of the wind. I, 
yeah, I don't know what happened there. It was just very was, strange. And then that's when like Frogger needs Grace and yeah, she's and able to help She just kind of walks in on him on this going on. But what's also very interesting is she says she does it for him twice during the movie. Yeah. And each time she says, it is very dangerous and it's going to yeah. kill us. But she's not touching him as far as we can see. Well, okay. So there's also visions. Yeah. The first time it happens... It seems like it's not so much whispering into his ear. Into his ear, it's like it's almost like licking his ear or something like that. Because mm-hmm. they describe the yeah, they describe he's experiencing all these weird visions of just kind of some weird space. It's kind of nonsensical. It seems to be what Grace used to. It Grace is yeah, because the script opened up on like an alien planet with a worm and some other creature and this other creature like eating the worm. And we end up finding out that her species, she basically is that worm. They're like giant human-sized worms or whatever. Oh, my God. The scene at the end where they describe them fighting, I just I couldn't take it seriously. Um, yeah. So, she... It's, it sounds like, yeah, I don't know. She kind of worms this guy <laughs> and it heals him. Um, and then she tells him how far she's gotten. Like, oh, you know, she found this old couple or this older lady and the girl or whatever. He's impressed. Yeah, he's like, oh, I couldn't do anything. Yeah. We also learned later that he's an alcoholic, so that might have something <laughs> to do with it. And he's got this other job selling Christmas decorations. Yeah, this is the, like, honestly, I think, like, this guy kind of could have got his own movie. He's the <laughs> weirdest character of this entire script. Um, yeah. Okay, so multiple times we have Spider and um, Grace kind of on their own. So mm-hmm. Grace got, gets invited to some sex club, I guess. Mm-hmm. They never really like. I don't. This was kind of a scene that doesn't need to be there because she's invited to this place. We don't even really find out what it is. Uh, it's just like a mansion or something. And then she needs a ride home, and she gets. Uh, I guess this Mark. is how she finds um, Frogner at the warehouse because she gets a ride from Spider, mm-hmm. who has to like rent a car and all stuff and go pick her but up. But knows how to drive because Marty doesn't. Yeah, she or I don't know if they say she doesn't know how to drive, it's just that she doesn't drive. Like yeah. she, I got the impression she just didn't feel comfortable driving. Um and so yeah, she goes and picks up Grace and they're like talking and then she basically drops the information of like, "Oh, this guy, he's been calling me, like you said earlier, he's been calling me and blah blah." blah. And that's how she finds him at the warehouse. Mm-hmm. So that I mean, that's kind of the part where she's like, "Oh, I'll be able to find you." And then she just accidentally finds him cuz somebody just happens to have the information. Yeah. Instead of her seeming just like this all-knowing person. Um Man, my notes are all over the place for this one. Yeah, this is I was telling you, this is the first time I didn't take notes cuz I really just flew through the script i want to know what happened next I, like i'm so surprised yeah. like it really grabbed you that much yeah i was into it i like i actually thought we were watching rogue one i'm like i want to read this <laughs> are you serious yeah that's insane because rogue one is amazing and i'm i like as i was reading this i'm like oh man i hope maggie isn't like mad about this one <laughs> <laughs> i was like i was thinking what an interesting world what is she what is she doing you know i just i will uh, say that from a sci-fi aspect it is very interesting yeah um i can i can get by something if it's an interesting world and i want to yeah. know more about it that that'll do it for me like reading wise yeah. i can i want to know why she I, I mean i didn't get all my answers i want to know why yeah. she was exiled she was a healer she you know she d- drops more and more information yeah like piece by piece throughout but yeah yeah like you said there's no real revelation yeah and even the ending it just kind of like her journey falls kind of flat which I was kind of expecting. Like, I expected the ending of this to be like, oh, she's going to decide to stay or she's going to die or like. Yeah, she wasn't getting in a tiny spaceship and flying off into the sunset. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't going to be an ending for this no, movie. No, that, I never saw that happen. No. And that, that's not really what happens. Um, so she, after the whole Frogner thing, she ends up going home. And this is where uh, Crosby comes back in. Oh boy. Which is a very weird scene. Yeah. So, I mean, he basically immediately starts raping her. And he's just like, oh, well, I know what you want. You just wanted somebody to, like, take control or whatever. Yeah, it was. And she uses her power that she used on the newspapers to pick up. It was her blouse. Like, he rips off her blouse and throws it across the room. And she uses it basically to telekinetically, like, pull him off of her 
And, yeah, and it hardens. Yeah, and then he ends up falling out the window. And then she just goes into work the next day. Yeah, well, that is <laughs> that is completely called out because it's yes, really interesting it through the course because Marty is her secretary. Yeah. And she definitely goes from the beginning to be like hero worship. She's like, she's perfect. She's a great she's business a high-powered woman. high-powered business woman I want to be here to kind of be like, what the fuck is going on? She yeah. goes, she because she leaves every day. She doesn't eat lunch apparently because Marty has to get her lunch. Yeah. And that's when she goes to the strip club. Yeah. And then they're like, and then she like literally says when she comes in the next day, she's a monster. Yeah, she's like this guy committed suicide at her apartment. She just doesn't yeah, care. Yeah, she tells Spider like, uh, this woman's a crazy monster, and I can't, you know, like. Yeah. And she's very openly hostile because Grace can hear her. Yeah, it's. I mean, I'm glad they called it out because it is one of those things. It's interesting because we don't always get a, a full grasp on grace's emotions i feel like and how yeah. so i find that interesting of like she's this isn't necessarily what she, she's interested in sex yeah. and getting home and she's not too worried and about a lot it. of other stuff yeah. yeah um speaking of her emotions there was one thing i forgot to mention earlier when she meets the fake john taiga he basically is like trying to blackmail her to give her the information that he has of like his last known whereabouts yeah. basically and her response to this is he's like she just punches him in the face. <laughs> He's just like, all right, fine. You can have it. I was just lonely. <laughs> and that's it. Yep. It's, like, it felt like we didn't need to go through that whole blackmailing thing because it literally lasts half a page and he just gives it up anyway. It's like, what was the point of that? If he's just going to give it up after one punch to the face. But that was, I thought that was actually a funny scene. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. I mean, the sci-fi stuff that's in here, it is interesting. She does create an interesting world. Like if you, if you just strip it down to, we got an alien on earth. She wants to get home. There's this underground alien society on earth. All of that is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I can definitely see where that aspect would be appealing. It's just th- all the details that start to bug me. Like it, it feels like an art film. Like, I definitely feel like, oh, you're just supposed to, like, understand or you're supposed to feel it or whatever. And for me, honestly, a lot of it was just going over my head. I mean, I don't know. The, the Some of the dialogue was pretty rocky for me. Um, like, once we got started getting towards the end, I was getting a little more into it. Yeah. But then, like I said, it just falls kind of flat. Yeah. I, um, I I'm trying to, like, describe why, like, but maybe, I don't know, I did watch a lot of art films and, like college i mean hey i'm not faulting you if you like i'm glad you found something (laughs) where i couldn't um but so this is gets to the point where we finally meet the real taiga and his the whole thing is he's like sloan wants her to find him because supposedly he has a spaceship and they can get off planet with it Mm -hmm. and he's like yes i have one but i don't know if i trust you and he's like i basically just need a day to think about it and I want to say there was something weird about this scene too where he's just because I feel like he's just like oh I needed to think about it and that's just like okay let's go and that's just kind of the whole theme of this it's just like oh we're gonna we can't do that okay let's do it yeah it moves quickly through some of these things that definitely could be expanded yeah because I mean I mean what this was like 117 pages which is yeah pretty average I feel like this would actually kind of have to be a longer movie um it would just know. be a lot to see. Yeah. And there's there's just a lot going on. Like, there's a lot of dialogue. So, it's not a lot of people just, like, oh, wandering around and you have to figure stuff out. Like, some movies I've seen. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I just I just wanted more, I guess. Um, so, Taiga, he, he shows his ship. Like, he has this little ship. And she's like, wait, that thing can't bring us anywhere yeah it's like oh no well this ship is the one that brings us to canada to the real <laughs> ship and then I, he says canada but then i thought they described a place that was in the states it was like some like i thought they said the great salt lake or something i couldn't quite get a grasp on where they were 100 percent because they seem to i, I just it, it jumps around a lot yeah. and it's this is a script where it's very descriptive on the characters and the emotions but it's not descriptive on like the environment where me and Vinny read the script for Resident Evil written by George Romero. And that dude went into such great detail describing like every room that they went into that it just got so confusing. Because <laughs> I was like, this guy clearly knows what he wants his house to look like, but I can't picture it. And this one is kind of the opposite. It's just like, oh, you don't need to know what this place looks like. It's just, this is where it is. 
And like for some places, like the underground club or whatever, it's like, oh, it's dark and there's booths and that's kind of all he gives yeah. you or she gives you. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I just I guess I just wanted a little more description of some things because, yeah, it's like, oh, like if, if unless you're reading the scene heading, you don't really know where they are. No. And I don't but. know New York very well. So I've never been there. So they're just listing off street names for me. It's just like, yeah, yeah, New York Street, whatever. <laughs> but I feel like I've seen so many movies that take place in New York. I, you get an idea. Yeah, I, don't know. I mean, some of it I recognize. Honestly, a friend of mine pointed this out a long time ago that we learned New York a lot by playing the Spider-Man game <laughs> just from <laughs> swinging around. And it always pops up like the areas you're in, like Soho yeah. and stuff like that. Like we actually learned how to get around New York a little bit. I don't know why, but I actually have a, a, a very hard time picturing stuff and as um, one reading scripts. And this one, I actually had less trouble so maybe it was how vague it was that your imagination was just able to yeah basically create whatever it wanted because uh i've talked about this with my husband i hate reading uh military stuff he loves reading military history oh really and i don't like i don't like the parts in star wars that are the battles when like in books that are described because yeah. for some reason that stuff is super hard for me to picture but this wasn't. This was really easy. I found it easier. I mean, I the thing about this one is it doesn't give you a lot to no. picture. So you can kind of just, as long as yeah, you know what the characters the are doing, yeah, yeah, you're filling in the blanks. Um, another weird scene is um, she runs into Spider again, and they, like, hop a cab together. And then they, the cab just somehow runs out of gas in, like, a really <laughs> shitty neighborhood. I thought that was the funniest. <laughs> like, first of all, how the fuck does a cab driver let this cab run out of gas? That has probably never happened. That one, this one kind of bothered me. And then they're like, oh, we're going to walk. Grace is like, I'm just going to walk through this park. Because it's implied throughout multiple times throughout the script. She's fearless. She like she knows she has some kind of powers and nothing can really. And also, she's oblivious of a lot of cultural things. Yes. You're not sure how long ago she got there. And Spider's kind of testing this occasion. Like, yeah. She's like, While they're in the cab, she's asking. She, um. What was the name? Uh, she says her landlord's name is like Lee Harvey Oswald yes. or something, and there's just no reaction. I loved that. I wish there was more of that. Yeah, there's a couple. Of, she like does it at first, like yeah. Over the course of the script, Spider starts to like yeah. realize something's up, and, but it's testing a real subtle like. Yeah, I I wish there was a lot more of that. I wish I could remember the other example too, because it was very obvious. And she's just like looking at her, and Grace is just like, "What's that?" Yeah, like, and I think that there was part the fearlessness, part of like. Well, she doesn't know this is bad. Yeah. That she's just going to go. Yeah, but the, she makes such a big deal about it. Like, oh, we can't walk through this park at night. Like, nobody does that. She's like, oh, well, I'm going to. And she goes. And Spider's like, well, I want to walk through the park at night, too. So she follows her. And then nothing happens. Like, I no. thought, like, oh, they're going to get jumped and she's going to do something. But no. So they just they go through the park. And it's like, I don't know. Why do you make such a big deal about it then? I, I don't know. Maybe it- it's from a woman's perspective type of thing of like... I mean, I, I guess. But if like you're going to point it, it out so much... There should be something happening yeah. there. Yeah, I could see that. Um, so while this is going on, Frogner is kind of losing his shit. And he confronts Sloan and just shoots him. Which I thought was interesting. Because I'm like, oh, really? We're just going to dispatch him like right away? But as it turns out, he Not didn't so much. do anything. Um, which Sloan turns out to be kind of an interesting <laughs> alien at some point. Because he's not an individual, he says he's an entire race later on. Mm -hmm. So, I guess so. I guess Spider. Uh, I guess we got to cover that first. Um, Spider ends up coming face to face with uh, Sloan because she goes looking for Frogner, and f at this point, Sloan has come back and he kills Frogner, and then Spider discovers them, and he ends up shooting her twice, and she's like dying. And Grace finds her. And then again, this is another one of those interesting moments of the script, I felt. Mm -hmm. um, and Grace does like a bonding with her. Yes. And that is very much looked down upon by with all the, the other aliens. Yeah. Do with a human. Yeah. You're, oh, like they think they literally call her like a disgusting human. But um, she, as she's dying, Spider's like, she's just like, look, are you an alien? Which yeah. I don't think there's been anywhere near enough clues to suggest that she would be an alien. Maybe Spider's I mean, an alien enthusiast. I yeah, know. I guess. I mean, she's clearly weird and there's something off about her. But an alien seems a little extreme of a conclusion. Um, but yeah, she's just like, yeah, I am. And then she does the bonding thing to try to show her like what she can do. Mm -hmm. And then she just brings her to the club and like lays her on the ground. 
And Spire's like, cool. Yeah, I'm she's dead. like, I just wanted to, like, I wanted, I did, I like, I like the line. She's like, I want to see something no other human has seen. Like, I yeah. thought that was a cool line. And then so she takes her to the club and she's just like, yeah, basically just like, this is awesome. And that just dies. Um, yeah, I, I, that was a scene I really liked. Mm-hmm. There, there's a couple scenes throughout the script. I'm like, I like this. It's just all the parts connecting this that I was having trouble with. Um, I feel like I was going to bring up something else about spider but now i can't remember what it was i guess i guess that's it um so oh so this is how we lead into um sloan being many <laughs> um so after she dies grace goes and confronts sloan and that's when we find out that he's not he's basically a whole species of tiny little aliens stuck that, together yeah and interesting interesting idea um, I do like that there's multiple different species of aliens. Yeah, it's interesting that there's so many different species, but they seem to have the same code. And also there seems to be some similarities because like, everyone knows bonding. Yeah. Um, that is I, something I took that as there must be some sort of intergalactic council yeah like i pictured something like mass effect like i don't know if you ever played mass effect yeah. but it was like playing it right now actually yeah but have you played any of the older ones i'm playing two right now you're playing two i'm okay. playing two while well, so, jake oh, yeah, is yeah, playing yeah, the yeah. new one yeah uh which two is the best one um i really like the first one actually that one i feel like if you're playing the second one and you it, you might not be able to go back to the first one because it's so different um yeah. i just played the ones we had so yeah um, so th- the whole thing in Mass Effect is like, oh, humans are new to the whole intergalactic council thing. Like they're considered a young species and they were brought in against a lot of people's wishes. And that's why they're kind of looked down upon in that series. And I kind of just pictured the same thing here is that like, oh, there's some intergalactic council out there. They that trade we- together. They communicate together. They know about Earth. Yeah. They- and they just use earth yes and but as like a dumping ground they don't like us mm-hmm. and i, I kind of just pictured it being the same thing yeah I could. so a lot of aliens probably know about each other they probably know what they're capable of but we don't get to see any of that because that would be too cool of a it movie. seems very interesting because grace doesn't seem to know because it seems like she actually wasn't supposed to she was supposed to die not end up there yeah cause so they say the ship was supposed to explode yeah because like the whole, yeah the whole thing she's like i was on my planet i was a healer and they sent me off. We never find a reason why. No. And that the ship was supposed to blow up. And it just instead it crashed here. And she crashed in the U- in England. I yeah. think she says. Yeah. And then she saw some people having sex. Of course. Because that's what the script is all about. Is people boning. And she modeled herself after the girl she saw. And then that's all the story we ever get for her. And then she becomes a high powered businesswoman. Yeah. Somehow for, and for all we know, this has been like two years. Like you said, like she, didn't know she doesn't who, know stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a lot of simple things that she doesn't know or like is just not in tune to. So yeah, I'd really like to know how she got the job she has, which they never even say what her businesswoman job high is. High powered business. Yeah. They, oh, they really emphasize how much money she has and that she's a high powered business. Killing woman. it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they never say what her business is. Do they? Does she no, buy she's a builder. Oh, that's right. She's yeah. she. I guess she because the other guy's the uh, she pretty much yeah because the other guy's the architect, isn't? Uh, oh, what's his face? Yeah. Architect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rapist. Yeah, the Crosby. There we go. <laughs> the rapist. rapist. Yeah. So yeah, she, she. It's like she finds the places where they're gonna build or something like that. I'm not sure what her position yeah. is as builder, but she is. So a she, build- she's just yeah. involved she's in architecture ar- to some. Yeah. Thing. Okay. So they do give us a reason. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Um, so yeah, she ends up killing Sloan by setting him on fire, mm-hmm. which it seemed like it was way too easy for her to do this. Cause they say she pulls out a lighter <laughs> and starts waving it around as Maybe if that's going to keep away a swarm of tiny little things Maybe coming at she you. she knew they were a super flammable species. I mean, I, I guess. Yeah, I Cause they say she lights the couch on fire. They try to go out the window. She lights the curtains on fire. And then she just runs out of the building and they're like, she, they imply that there's like a bunch on. So this is what I don't understand. There's a bunch on her. So she, obviously she's going to try to brush those off. And then they talk about the ones that are still alive are running out of the building and just getting stepped on in the streets. Is nobody noticing this? Nobody's noticing the swarm of little creatures coming out. Very, it's New York. Everything's weird. I, I guess. But I mean, come on. I mean, a roach infestation, I guess. They don't describe how they look. So I didn't really get a no. sense of like, oh, would people just confuse these for bugs? 
wasn't. But it's like, what about the ones that were still attached to her? I mean, there's no way she killed all of them. Could they reproduce? I, I don't know. It just seems like a short-term fix to a problem. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this kind of brings us into our ending where she goes to meet Tyga, who, I don't know, for how important they build this guy up to be, he doesn't really do much. Uh, um, yeah, but he's important to the end of her story. Yeah. Uh, I guess we did pass up a scene where he locked her in the spaceship at one point. Oh, yeah. Um, to figure stuff out. Yeah. He doesn't like, tell her why at the time. Yeah, but. again, this is a weird scene where it's... um. So he's like, oh, let's check out the spaceship. And she gets in and he just slams the door shut and runs away. And you're like, all right. And then she just gets out and goes to find him again. And he's just like, oh, I knew I was losing control around you. So I was just like going to cool off. But I was on my way back to come get you right when you walked in the door. And again, it's just like if that's how you're transitioning your scene, why is it there at all? But it is the thing that tells us that they are the same species. Which apparently do not get along. No, they're the uh, warring species from the same planet. Are they warring species? I believe so. I thought it was implied that they were the same species. Because she's the worm and he's the guy. Okay, yeah. So in the beginning, it was like a worm and another creature fighting. And so, uh, skipping ahead a little bit, they kind of come... Oh my god, this is so ridiculous. They come face to face and she's like, look, I bonded with a human. And so automatically he just is like, I'm done with you. Yeah, yeah. And so they fight and the fight mimics the fight from the beginning, but they're in their human forms. (laughs) But it says they take the form like visually of their actual species. So she gets all worm-like as That's a human. That's the part that I could not take seriously. When they say, like, her arms, she still has arms, but they're, but they're by like their stuck side, to her and side. she's a worm now. So like, is she slithering on the ground, or is she standing, standing wriggling like, like a worm? You? I have, I, <laughs> was so God, ridiculous. I could not. That was the one part. I'm like, all right, some special effects guys. Yeah. yeah I'm going to have to I, fix this for her. Like, when I read that this was... Like, they're aliens hidden on Earth. I honestly thought we would never see any kind of alien form at all. I mm-hmm. thought it would just be, like, Third Rock from the Sun. Like, they imply they're aliens, but you only see them as humans. Mm-hmm. I did not expect this. No. <laughs> so. And, yeah, and then at the near the end of the fight, uh, he, like, grows stuff to try to take out all our juice. Or, like, stick, yeah, they imply stick her and drain her, pretty much. And that's going to sustain him or whatever. And it's it's they say that the fight mimics the fight at the beginning, like it happens the same way. But instead of when the creature killed the worm, this time she manages to fake him out and she kills him instead. At that point, she does not become fully human because she definitely gets like suckers. Yeah, they some kind of they say it's like some kind of spike thing comes yeah. out of her and stabs him and and drains, drains him. him. And then it's just like, oh well, there goes my ride because he hid the spaceship and she tries to look for it which yeah i didn't understand so he says that oh i always assumed that we would work it out and be together i guess is what he's saying but then he wants to kill her because she bonded with a human yeah i think i think think he kind of mentions that he's suppressing instinct like the reason that he locked her in the spaceship was because yeah he kind of he figured out what she was and he was suppressing like his instinct to kill her. Uh, yeah, because the problem was they're like, could they travel through space and not kill each other? Yeah. And I think that once he found out that she was gross, he's yeah. like, why am I so suppressed? Let's kill <laughs> oh, her. You're gross. I'm yeah. going to kill you. Yeah. I think that's pretty much what happened when she's like. He's like it was I'm, just such a quick turn. Yeah. Which, I mean, he's never like a nice guy throughout the script. So I guess it's not that much of a turn. Yeah. But it was just natural really enemies. weird. Yeah. They're natural enemies, though. And he decides yeah. to stop. Um, suppressing it and so then this leads us to earlier in the script sloan as she was killing sloan he was kind of like begging for his life type situation Mm -hmm. and he mentioned that he heard that there was another landing on in marrakesh and so the script just kind of ends with her booking a flight to marrakesh just Mm -hmm. implying that like well i guess this is just going to start all over again yeah there's kind of well there's kind of the scene where she's thinking about meeting vic yeah, right. like, she, like she calls and you Vic. see like, OK, so she's going to try and make it. And then it's like she can't. She's got to again. The way that dialogue was written, too. It was just like, oh, I want to spend time with you. Oh, wait, no, I don't. <laughs> I just I just felt like that was the whole process of writing this thing. There was a little bit too much internal struggle that was simplified in dialogue. Yeah. And 
I feel like this would have been a really good book. Yeah. Like, I would like to, like, I don't know who owns this. I think Universal has it, is what I last read. Because she was able to go other places, right? Yeah, and but they own the script. script. Okay. Because I think she was working for them. Okay. And it's, it might be one of those situations that anything you work on while you're working for us, we technically own, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> or she sold it to them. I have no idea. Um, but it seems it's basically just like they have it. It's on a shelf. It's never going to happen is mm-hmm. what I'm understanding. I mean, would you want to see this movie like as written? I mean, maybe not um, as written. No. Of the dialogue. Yeah. The, I think that if the dot, I think that the plot with the world, there's something there. The dialogue. Yes. Yeah. I think if they could make the like the quick changes and everything, I think some of it makes sense, but it just needs to be written a little bit better yeah uh and just yeah it's a I mean, lot of, is, is there anything you can think of off the top of your head that you would change like in the last part where she just kind of like when okay the part where they quickly change from you shouldn't come with me because it's dangerous to <laughs> yes it's dangerous not to come with me okay it's like i could see a world where something to that effect works with yeah. good acting yeah. In a bit of a, you know, like you could see a struggle of just like, but it, reading it one line after another, it's like, okay, you know, where she thinks about it, she goes like, I don't know. I couldn't, but I, I could see a world where a cleaned up version of that does work. Yeah. Um, which actually I forgot about this. Um, casting. I, oh, saw I saw some, that. did you see? Yeah. Um, I can only remember two, which was Kim Basinger and Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> what was I remember? There was a, the girl from Romancing the Stone. I can't remember her name. Mm. Uh, and she played Chandler's dad, mom, in Friends. I don't remember. Uh, I, I can't remember her name. Can't and I think you. Carrie Russell was another one. That might be one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Fiverr I could easily see. Like, reading it, that's kind of... Like, she wouldn't be my first choice, and neither would Kim Basinger. Yeah, I don't know. I Honestly, guess- the girl from Romancing the Stone, whose name I cannot remember, she, to me, out of the list of like four or five that there were, that was the one that kind of stood out to me. I just, I don't know. I saw kind of an edgier woman in my mind, I guess. I mean, Michelle Pfeiffer, I think, yeah. would fit that. Um, more modern. I guess because I'm reading it and thinking more modern. Yeah, stuff, I mean, this was yeah, 1980. It's, yeah. it's hard to <laughs> um, see now, I guess, but yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I have to find out who this actress was from Rose because it's like on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, I might have it open as well. Um, but it's to me, she was the perfect choice. I know people who have seen that movie are just screaming right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was interesting to kind of read it. It was on. Did you were you on HR Geeker's website? Or official I website? did. I that's where I saw the. Yeah, the I didn't. I didn't read everything on his I website. I it as well. Yeah, uh, but, but um, that's where I saw the little casting thing. Kathleen Turner. That's All what right. it was. Kathleen Turner yeah. would have been my choice out of those people. Yeah, this is interesting. But um, I, I think, yeah, I think that the the plot in the world has something there with the dialogue cleaned up a little bit. I think, yeah. I think it could have been a really interesting movie. Yeah, like, a, like, like I said, the idea of her being trapped and wanting to leave in the underground society. I think you take that stuff and you could really build it out into something interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely don't think that this draft would have <laughs> made a good movie. Um, no, not this draft. I mean, when you read it after you were done, like, how did you feel about, like, oh, the greatest sci-fi script never made? Like, I thought it was interesting that, I don't know, I I honestly haven't read a lot of sci-fi scripts, you know, so yeah. I could see how that... But I mean, that, comparing it to other sci-fi movies you've seen, like, like I said, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, I could, but I could see sci-fi scripts in general being bad if that makes sense yeah. i mean because it's i feel like it's a hard genre to do, a genre that doesn't always have the best dialogue no that definitely can, not that can be kind of hard to get into onto page all the time and, and sci-fi is one of those things like a lot of people who did star wars even they say like yeah you read that stuff on the page and it sounds ridiculous and we just found a way to make it work yeah and that's kind of the actor's job um I'm yeah, reading Carrie Fisher's uh, last book right now. Which oh, is are you very Princess Diarist? Yeah. Oh my god, I wanted that so bad. Yeah, it's very interesting, especially hearing her talk about like this uh, about the dialogue <laughs> and that kind of yeah. stuff is interesting. Which just sounds like they ended up making up a lot of it as they went. Yeah, like it's or compromises yeah. where like George Lucas had like crazy stuff, and she's like, "Well, that's not." Yeah, I mean, and maybe that. Maybe that's just how it is, because as we said in, when we read Star Wars, that a lot of the dialogue seemed robotic, 
And to me, that's how I felt with this one. And it's a common complaint for sci-fi. Um, I mean, I read some sci-fi books. Like, I read the Ender's Game series pretty heavily. Of those. Yeah. It's, Ender's Game is one of my all-time favorite books. I know there's some people that aren't cool with Orson Scott Card's politics. Well, yes. I don't care about his politics. I like those books. Um, and I, I never felt like, oh, this is like some corny dialogue or anything like that. And that I mean, yeah. but that's a book. That's, yeah. There's a reason it's a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the movie was not great. No. It was okay. It was I, I, I enjoy it just because it's Ender's Game, but it's it's all right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any final thoughts on The Tourist? No, it'd be interesting to see if any, anything ever happens with it. Yeah, I mean, it's what, 40, 30, 40 years. Um, I'd, so I'd no. say at this point, it's probably dead. But I would make a book. Yeah. I'd, I'd make, you take this idea, make a book. I'm interested to look in, because the one that I did look up, I looked at some of the stuff, but not her career. So I'd be interested to see what else she's Did she done. do anything else? Did you I see? I don't know. I, I, honestly, I just looked at that uh, an article about the kind of, the same one you did, I'm sure. Yeah, maybe. I that looked was at pretty a few. much it. Um, yeah, I mean, from what I understand, it really like hurt her not That's being able to rough. do this. Um, and the the guy I was telling you about, the director or whatever, basically the way he was like an asshole to her, which I guess some people say he ended up regretting later. I guess that really hurt his career too, because he yeah. it kind of yeah it implied that he was difficult to work with and he didn't do anything for a long time. I, I can't remember him, but this is all pretty easy stuff to find looking up. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it more than <laughs> I did. Uh, it was it was pretty rough for me. I would say this is probably one of the more rough ones I've read and. I, it, it wasn't what I expected, is all I would say. Um, I didn't completely hate my time with it. <laughs> I love that when I go to IMDb, The Mist is being advertised to me, huh? as if that isn't nine years old. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I was trying to pull up her IMDb page, but I I mean, she worked for a studio. My assumption was she had to have gone yeah, to do something. A, if you're under contract from a studio, the A, there's usually a reason why, B, there's... Yeah, I mean, like unless this did. just soured everything so much that they were just like, no, never again. No, and I mean, maybe she just worked behind the scenes on stuff. Yeah, I can't get it to load. But uh, yeah, any any final thoughts with the tourists? That's pretty much it. All right. Yeah, I think that's going to be it for me. Um, I look forward to our next one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'll say. Okay, I did get it up. She wrote like two things. Oh. She was a writer on a TV series in 1988 and 1997. Oof. Oh, it says writer on something called The Hunger in 97. I guess that's a TV series. She wrote one episode of both of those. And she worked in the sound department on like a documentary. Oh. So, yeah, I guess not, not much of a career, career for her. Yeah. yeah, and then the tourist writer, which, I mean, I'm sure she got paid for that. Good. I assume she got, as she sold it, maybe she's living off of that. I hope so. Um, but yeah, I don't know. If she's out there, I'd love to hear from her. <laughs> I don't even know if she's still alive at this point. Um yeah all right well thanks for sitting with me no problem and i i look forward to our next one i'm sure it'll be a lot more fun <laughs> than this one um but yeah do you have anything you need to plug or anything probably mm-hmm. not no nope. yeah, just working <laughs> if you want to follow me on twitter it's at maggie geimer i don't tweet yeah i don't i don't even think i follow <laughs> you because i think you told me that I don't not tweet. um yeah but other than that you can follow us on twitter at shelf podcast you can email the show at shelledfilmpodcast at gmail.com. And maybe while I got you here, I'm actually looking for top 10 lists, like movie related top 10 lists that like people might want to see me talk about. Um, like anything like, hey, what are my top 10 movies, top 10 movie theme songs or whatever? Because for like the mini episodes, I keep finding myself not having a lot to talk about. Because if I don't watch a movie that I can review, it's just like, oh, well, here's the script on Friday. And that's all I'm saying. So I don't like having just five minute mini episodes. So if you have any top 10 lists, and if you think of any, um, you can send them to me on Twitter or to my Gmail account. So I'm looking for that if anybody's looking for it. Um, But other than that, just be sure to review the show on iTunes because that helps us. That gets the show in front of people. And Maggie, thanks for talking to the tourist. I had fun. (laughs) (laughs) All right.